Okay, good morning. Thank you. So our textbook, and really all helpivist textbooks, all helpivist textbooks are the same. The textbook in chapter six has a whole lot of stuff to do with the geometry, like finding surface areas and two different sections on finding volumes and stuff like that. And I've stripped that down a little because it's frankly repetitive and kind of boring and mostly not very applied. I've kept in the stuff that seemed important to me. And the first sort of piece of geometry we're going to look at is area. And we've already looked at areas, as a matter of fact. If we have a Cartesian plane and we have a curve, on some interval, then the integral can be thought of as an area. The area of this region is the integral of f of x dx from a to b. So it's not a surprise that the integral can be used to study area. And in this section, we're actually still in chapter five for reasons that I don't understand. This gets smushed together with, um, with U substitution in the textbook. But what we're going to look at now is if instead of a curve and an axis, we have two curves. And we want to find the area between these curves. And this is a really important thing. Um, traditionally, calculus textbooks do a very bad job of explaining why this matters. We get kind of insipid examples where we're like painting weirdly shaped rooms. Um, but this is a super powerful thing to ask. It has a lot of applications in business, which when I get to applications is where I'll I'll take my application from, but it also shows up a lot when we want to know how far two curves are from each other. I mean, if we look at these two curves, and then we look at these two curves, our intuition is probably that the two curves on the right are closer together than the two curves on the left. But how can you solidify that intuition? I mean, the distance between the curves isn't fixed. Well, you can solidify the intuition by pointing out that the area between those curves on the right is smaller than the area between those curves on the left. So that means we won't try to build suspense. I'll just give the formula, and then we'll try we'll talk a little about where this formula comes from. For the moment, we're going to assume that one of these curves is always bigger than the other curve. So we have an upper curve and a lower curve. And we are on some interval from A to B. And the area between these curves is gotten by integrating the distance. 
not the distance. The difference is the word I was looking for. The integral from A to B of f of x minus g of x. So where this formula comes from, let's think of, let's cast our mind back and let's try to think of where the integral formula comes from. You have the x-axis, you have a curve, and you broke your curve into pieces. And you created a bunch of rectangles. And the height of this rectangle, I should use a We have some value in the interval. And the height of the rectangle is the function at that value. And the width of this rectangle, let's just say they're all the same width. Let's just say they're all delta x. And we create a Riemann sum. And then we take the limit as the number of rectangles goes to infinity and the widths of the rectangles go down to zero. So we're just taking this idea and modify, and then when we take the limit, this will turn into an integral. Well, what we're doing is we're taking this idea and modifying it slightly. Now, instead of that function, we have an upper function and a lower function. But we can still, you know, we can still draw rectangles angles to try to approximate the areas between these curves. And now this rectangle really should be a little higher up. So now we've got our x sub zero. And the height of this rectangle is no longer simply f. The height of this rectangle is now the upper value minus the lower value. So the height of the rectangle is f of x zero minus g of x zero. The width of the rectangle is still delta x. We're still taking the areas of these rectangles and adding them all up. And we still take a limit as these rectangles um, become thinner and thinner and the number goes to infinity. And now, once again, this sum is going to turn into an integral, except, I mean, you can probably guess if the, if the sum of f turns into the integral of f, then the sum of f minus g is going to turn in to the integral of f minus g. So that's where this formula comes from. 
And we can do an example for who. Let's say that one of our functions is, oh, I don't know, one over x plus e to the x. And the other function is negative x. And let's say we're looking at these functions on an interval from, from one to three. And we'd like to find the area between the curves. So we're going to start by graphing these. Um, does everybody have a TI calculator, by the way, or something like that? I mean, I'll just graph this on Desmos, but you'll want it for tests and the homework and stuff. Um, and the reason that I am starting by graphing this is that to use this formula, we need an upper function and we need a lower function. And maybe we could sort of work out which of these functions is bigger and which is smaller. You know, presumably the one with the negative sign is smaller. But the easiest way to answer that question is graphic. F of x equals one over x plus e to the x. G of x is negative x. We're looking at both of these between one and three. And we do see our presumed intuition is correct. This function where everything is positive is bigger, and this function where everything is negative is smaller. And once we know that, these problems, well, at least setting these problems up becomes plug and play. It's the bigger function minus the smaller function. We always want to be careful when we're doing these things, it's easy to know the calc to this and still make sort of freshman algebra errors. In particular, notice that we're subtracting negative x. So that's going to be positive. And now I said setting this up is bug and play. Um, taking an integral can be anything from straightforward to impossible to do by hand. So I can't say that actually finding these areas is going to be simple. But of course, for this preliminary example, I selected functions that we'll be able to integrate and work with. Let me copy so we have some space. One over X plus E to the X plus X DX. 
And now if we want this definite integral, we need to find the indefinite integral, or really we just need to find an antiderivative, but that's basically the same thing. And as long as we have just addition and subtraction, um, we can do this piecewise. Products, we can't really do. Quotients, we can't really do. But addition and subtraction, and we're adding three things together, and we just deal with them one by one. So the antiderivative of one over x is what? Oh, that is exactly correct. Thank you. Somebody else, the antiderivative of e to the x. e to the x. e to the x is its own antiderivative. Somebody else, the antiderivative of x. x squared. Close. Remember, is it one half x? Squared? It's one half x squared. And we're evaluating from one to three. And usually my, my least favorite part of these problems, maybe I shouldn't admit that having a least favorite part, but it's just a messing around with our calculator that comes after we've made it with the antiderivative that may get our calculator loaded up real quick. So the absolute value of three is three. Plus e cubed plus one half times Let's at least make our life a little easier by just doing that in our head. One half of nine minus the absolute value of one is one, e to the first. And again, just doing stuff in our head when we can, one squared is one. Now, actually, let me at least write everything down. And now this goes into the calculator. Um, integration, I mean, calculus in general, is a very applied branch of mathematics. Sometimes if you look like, look the odd answers up in the back of the book, the textbook will go to great pains to write things like, oh, this is exactly the square root of three plus the square root of nine over four or whatever. In the real world, basically no use for that ever. We'll just always get decimal approximations for these integrals. And let me see. So it was the natural log of three plus e to the third power plus what? One half times nine. Yeah. Not plus nine halves. Notice this whole thing is going in parentheses. This next thing will go in parentheses to natural log of one plus e to the first is e, but no harm in writing that, plus e to the first plus. One half, is it? Mm. Okay, press the wrong button there. 22.466. Without 
without uh, word problem and significant digits. It's always kind of arbitrary what we round to. So that's finding area, at least in its most sort of basic form. Why did we add the E after one over X? When in the original problem, it was one over X times E to the X. It shouldn't have been times. Did I write it down wrong? At least I thought it was times. Oh, I guess not. Well, yep. Okay. Thank you. Let's. Let's not go too far into this without seeing some kind of application, even if it breaks things up a little. So there won't be like homework on this or anything, but it's a nice application from my point of view because it's self-contained and easy to understand. And the stuff we're using from economics is all stuff we could don't need a degree in economics to talk about. Let's start by introducing the Lorentz curve. So this is written L of X and X. is stuck between a zero and one. And L of X, one of these functions from economics, they're never going to be able to write that like it's the sine or the cosine or whatever, but you can explain what it is. It's the proportion of a nation's wealth that's controlled by the poorest X proportion of the population. Let's try to untangle with this with an example. You've probably heard the phrase the one person that a disproportionate amount of America's wealth is controlled by 1% of its citizens. In America, this is probably outdated by now, but L of 0 0.99 is about 0. 6, 7. And this means that the poorest 99% of Americans control 67% of the nation's wealth and that conversely must mean that the richest one percent control 33 percent of the nation's wealth. So there's that idea of the one percent, that a small number of citizens 
control a large proportion of the wealth in America. A nation with wealth equality would have a Lorenz curve of L of X equals X. The poorest 1% controls 1% of the wealth. The poorest 2% controls 2% of the wealth, and so on. And I suppose whether you think that's desirable or not is a political or social issue, but something that people are interested in is how close is a nation to having wealth equality, or how far away is a nation from having wealth equality. So let's look. The Lorenz curve goes from zero to one, and its range is also zero to one. And here is wealth equality. Here's what wealth equality looks like. There aren't any nations that actually have this as their Lorenz curve. A real Lorenz curve might look something like that. It will be strictly below L of X equals X. If the Lorenz curve was ever actually was ever somehow higher then L of X equals X. That would mean that the poorest people controlled a disproportionate amount of the wealth. And that wouldn't make any sense because then they wouldn't be the poorest people. So going back to the suggestion I made earlier that this area between curves is often used to investigate how close or how far away two curves are from one another. If we want to know how close this nation is to wealth equality, and we've got this sort of equality curve and the real curve, Well, essentially, you look at the area between those curves, that area A. And this is almost something that, that economists call the Gini index. It's almost the Gini index because economists like the rest of us like working with nice scales. Um, something like a scale from zero to one is a nice scale. Um, it's in the eyes of most people, nicer than a scale that goes from zero to one half. And this area A is somewhere between zero and one half. Um, and that's, that's just high school geometry. This area is smaller than this entire triangle. The area of this triangle is one half. So, Economists take that number and multiply it by two. And now we have an index that's between zero and one. And the smaller this number is, the closer it is to wealth equality. The bigger it is, the more inequality there is between countries.
And now, that area is the integral between zero and one. The upper curve is x. The lower curve is the Lorentz curve. So the Gini index is the area between curves, more or less, it's an integral. And this is also a good example, you know, I don't know how much I should focus on this. I don't want to be discouraging. I mean, in calculus two classes, you spend a lot of time computing integrals by hand. In the real world, integrals are normally computed using technology. And this is an excellent example of an integral that you absolutely can take, but you can never take it by hand because this Lorentz function is never going to be like x squared or the sine of x or anything that we know how to deal with. It's just going to be something that we have a numerical approximation of. So out of interest, at one point I had this all written down, but I don't seem to anymore misspelled that. Okay, the World Bank is being annoying. All right, here we go. So, the Gini index is between zero and one. You see the World Bank has chosen to multiply that by a hundred to get a value between zero and a hundred. Here are sample indexes. Let's look at us. A Gini index of about 39.8%. So could be better, could be worse. I mean, if you look at South Africa, for example, this Gini index is much higher. This represents, if you recall, the idea that wealth inequality is worse in South Africa, that a small number of people control a huge amount of the nation's wealth. On the other hand, Poland, 28.8, Poland has less inequality than America. It's closer to wealth, to wealth equality because the Gini index is smaller. So that was kind of an aside, but I always try to give applications when I can because the textbook basically does it. It sort of gives up on applications when it reaches chapter seven or so. And I think it's good to try to stress that we're not doing this stuff simply to amuse ourselves. All the material we cover in these classes really is used for something. We'll now look at a few more complicated examples, but does anybody have any questions before we do? Let's find the area between y equals x squared 
and y equals the square root of x. So it doesn't mean anything that I'm not using function notation. It's just for a bit of variety. Uh, and the difference between this problem and the last problem I did is that we don't have an A and a B written on the board. I'm not telling you what interval we're looking at. And when you're not given an interval, what that's going to mean is that these curves trap some region between them in the following way, back to back to Desmos. Here is the square root of x. And here is x squared. And I mean, the area between these curves, if you took it literally, would be infinite. There's an infinite area where x squared is bigger than the square root of x. But you also see that there's this little region here, this little finite region that is trapped between these curves. So if they're just asked for the area between curves with no, uh, no limits and no other comment, this is the situation we're in. Our two curves are enclosing some finite region. Let's see if I can make this most shade this. Yes. So this is the region that we're looking for. And to find the area of this region, we need two things, three things really. We need the upper and the lower curve. We can just look at these. The square root is bigger. The quadratic is smaller. We also need limits of integration. Let me write stuff down as we go, though. So before we worry about limits of integration, here's our bigger curve. Here's our smaller curve. For the limits of integration, well, notice that this region begins where these curves touch each other, and it ends where these curves touch each other. Um, limits of integration in these problems are going to be points of intersection, points where the curves touch. And theoretically, then, to find the limits you would set the curves equal to each other, because the places where the curves touch are precisely the places where they're equal. Um, I don't want to do that. I mean, in particular, this is a calculus class, and if we have, you know, messy or curves than this, I don't want your calculus homework to be 10 minutes trying to solve algebraic equations. So I always just find these limits graphically. Yeah. And how you find these points of intersection graphically 
is going to depend on your graphic utility. Desmos makes it nice and easy. You click around where the curves intersect and it pops right up. We start at x equals zero, we end at x equals one. Using somewhat more primitive uh, graphing utility, your calculator. Well, let's take a look at the square root of x and let's take a look at x squared. And we can sort of see this region here. Let me, let me mess around with these viewing windows a bit so that we can see it all more clearly. So we can see the region and hiding up in out this blue menu up here. So you get it by pressing the second button and then the trace button. Your calculator will also find points of intersection for you. If you press intersect, here's the first curve, here's the second curve. And then because there can be multiple points of intersection, I mean, in this case, there are clearly two, one here and one there, it asks for you to move the cursor somewhere close to where the point of intersection you're looking for is. That's what it means when it says yes. So we press enter and we get snapped to the point of intersection. So this point of intersection here is one, x equals one. It's maybe a little uh, hard, I mean, in this particular case, the X and the Y are both one, but we're integrating with respect to X. Our variable is called X, our D is DX. So we're looking at the X values here. X equals one. And uh huh. Okay, thank you for that. I hope you're not going to just keep misbehaving while I'm trying to show this to my students. Here's the first curve, there's the second curve. Now it wants a guess. I think they intersect somewhere near there. Man. Okay, our calculator is being weird. I mean, I think our calculator is being weird because, because the algorithm it's using is using tangent lines. And at the origin, this blue curve has a vertical tangent line with no slope. And I think that's breaking the calculator's algorithm somehow. And I guess if all else fails, you can just say, well, we look at where these curves meet. It sure looks like they're meeting somewhere around here x equals zero, y equals zero. So, calculator failed us a little there, but at least Desmos uh, gave us very concrete answers, zero and one. And then once you've set the integral up, 
it's either going to be straightforward or not straightforward, depending on what the functions we're looking at are. Here, more straightforward than not, I'd say, because we've just got addition and subtraction and there's no composition or multiplication or division. Also, because we've just got power functions and power functions we should be able to deal with. So the antiderivative of the square root of x, of x to the one half is what? Two thirds x to the three halves. Two thirds x to the three halves is correct. We bump the one half up, and then when we divide by three halves, it becomes two thirds. Antiderivative of x squared one third times x to the third. That is exactly correct, thank you. We now stick those in. And I mean, I'll write everything down because this is an early example. It's actually a rare case of everything working out nicely and we won't need to go to our calculators. Well, I should say you can go to your calculator if you want to, but one to any power is one. So this is two thirds minus one third. And zero to any power is zero. So those are all zeros on the right. And two thirds minus one third is one third. And we are not quite done with this section, but this with three minutes remaining seems like an excellent time to pause the lecture. We are right on track. We'll finish this section tomorrow. Remember, that's a Thursday, so an 8 a.m. meeting time.